share one professional thing everybody needs to know and when should they call you and also a private thing nobody knows yet and since we're you know among ourselves and only a few thousand people probably watching your live stream um, don't worry I, mean, I can start with it so what do you need to know uh, professionally with me you know uh, and call me when you know you want to hack the attention of your customer and the private thing is I have been fan of Handball Sports Club for a long time and I'm looking for the first national title since 1988. It doesn't look good currently, so um, yeah. So that's that's my private secret. Hi, my name is Arthur Lee. Um, I'm with One Degree Hong Kong. Um, for those who who do know, but just in case you don't have not heard, One Degree Hong Kong is um, uh, one of the virtual insurer uh, applicants um, uh, in uh, to for for the virtual insurance license in Hong Kong, and we. Uh, Expect to have a license sometime next year. So we will be a genuine insurance company. And I joined the company four months ago. And before I joined the company, I was always in the life and health insurance industry. And just to share with you, in in in, in our company, uh, we have more tech guy than the insurance guy. So I'm the insurance guy. So they call me the insurance guy. Uh, good morning everybody, my name is Neil Gardner, I'm the Chief Customer Officer of Generali. Um, for those that may not know Generali very well, uh, we are one of Europe's uh, oldest and largest insurance companies. Been in Asia uh, since the mid-70s. Um, I have a, a broad remit in the organisation, but I, I class myself functionally as a marketer. Um, and like most marketers out there, I have a degree in statistics. Um, and on the private side, um, I'm in full midlife crisis mode and I did my first triathlon on the weekend. <laughs> wow, congratulations. I think that's worth a round of applause, guys. You make that. Yes, congratulations. Um, and my first question is we're talking about the customer, which is sometimes I have the impression a rare debate we have in the insurance industry. Um, what are your experiences? How did the customer change? How did we see in your ecosystems? And what do you expect uh, the, the change of customer behavior that in insurance, but especially also outside insurance? Um, you want to start? Yeah, I mean, obviously, the consumer in 2019 is incredibly demanding, and I think I, I blame that on every other industry out there because I think insurance is one of the last bastions of mediocre customer service and we can take that as a broad mediocre that's already very good. But, you know, I, I aspire to mediocre, you know, that's, uh, that's in my goals now. Um, you know, it, and so it's, it's a challenge for us because um, we're not necessarily in control of the expectation. You know, whether it, whether it comes from someone like Amazon doing a one-click or, 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 or service, you know, service companies really delivering um, superior customer service, you know, the way that, that, that Apple has moved into retail stores with what, with what the experience they bring there. I, I think that, for me, is, is both the challenge and something that, that, that gives enthusiasm to the teams because it sets the bar. It sets the bar for all of us. Was there a single incident where you thought, wow, the customer really changed? Um, I'll come back to that. Let me have a think about that. Okay, okay. Yeah. Arthur, what was, was your view on the customer? You have been here in Hong Kong for quite some time. You are from here, you are from the city. Um, how does the customer take here and did uh, he or she change also? Yes, I have always been, been in the insurance industry since I graduated from the university and it was a long time ago. And um, I would say in Hong Kong, um, the customer and in fact the, the insurance market go through uh, a few cycles and at the very early stage uh, it was still in high interest rate market so so whole life and diamond was the popular product and at that time the sales proposition was very, very, very simple yeah so customer expectation is not that much just a high interest rate and then come the investment name product and the, the financial crisis time uh, the, the supply prices and and the investor, uh, the customer has gone through different cycles of the economy and then they have seen different products and at each time uh, 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 the product cycle change, customer expectation change. Mm. Nowadays with more and more information available through different media, different platform, in fact customer has a very high expectation on not only insurance product but all all kinds of consumer product, financial product. 
And, and what are like the most popular um, channels and uh, best practices when it comes to customer experiences uh, in Hong Kong? So where does a customer spend his time with and when is he really excited in a buying and shopping experience? Um, well, that, um, I, I think the, the biggest way for change I have seen in the past few years is um, um, people start to buy on Taobao. Okay. Maybe um, for the people who don't know what that is, especially from, from the rest, what is Taobao? <laughs> Taobao is the, the biggest online purchase, uh, online um, channel for, for you can buy almost <laughs> everything, even including financial products. Uh, um, and Taobao is a China uh, website that uh, then you can buy it not only from China, you can buy it from Hong Kong, the goods you can ship from China to Hong Kong. And you can, you can even buy it in the States and, and in Europe. They ship it all the way to, to the, the whole world. And that really changed everything. People, I, I, um, I, I was always in Hong Kong. And Hong Kong is so convenient. People don't, don't need to worry about buying things, even in the midnight. I go downstairs and walk a few minutes, I, I can find a store, supermarket, 24 hours, and 24 hours, McDonald's, I can buy anything. So, so, almost, so almost like insurance then. <laughs> Uh, insurance is going to be okay. like that. One, one more question um, concerning that. Um, how is the, the buying process of an insurance then here? Is it also one click buy like Taobao or uh, Amazon or do I need to wait for a policy a few weeks? It's, uh, it's a good question. Uh, maybe I, I share my view and, and uh, you can, can supplement. Uh, um, in the insurance in Hong Kong is still very traditional up to this moment. Um, Majority of the insurance are sold through agents and, and broker and other intermediary banks of other channels. Um, and the, the process is very manual and human human behavior. Well, what does that mean manual? Like well, how do I have imagine the situation? Um, you can you can okay. There, there's a scene that I have seen in I think two years ago during a typhoon. Uh, there is an office building next to this hotel, which is ho which house a few insurance company. Because of the typhoon, some some of the glass wall broke, and you see paper flying outside the, the window. And there's an insurance company. Oh, it's right. all that hurts. Paper. <laughs> what, is, what is your perspective on this? I, I, I think um, Arthur is true, I think within the Asian context, and going back to your original yeah. question about how the customers change, I think that one of the aha moments for myself was when I was working in Korea, and we did some, some, some analysis on, um, on who was buying products online and who was going to our agency force, and what we actually identified was that um, a lot of people over the age of 55 were buying, were buying online. Uh, and a lot of people under the age of 35 were going to their agent and that, that was kind of in reverse of what we expected and a lot of that was to do with product complexity in that the, the, the older generation had a much better understanding of their, of their medical needs and their requirements and were able to automatically go through the underwriting questions without guidance yeah. but, the, but the younger generation who haven't been through that experience before of buying insurance were really struggling a little bit so that for us was uh, it helped understand the behaviors of both the consumer and the complexity of what we were been building. But uh, you both mentioned the agent and broker, you know, um, around the world, in different ecosystems, they play a different role, but I think that's very strong in, in most markets. Now we have, um, you know, internet coming out, the platforms, you both mentioned the different uh, names. Um, do you think the broker uh, is dead or what is the future of the agent and broker? As an organization, we are uh, wholly committed to the role of, uh, role of the agents. We have 155,000 agents around the world, um, and, and it's very much part of our lifetime partner strategy is how that agent interacts with the consumer. Now, um, it might be that in the, in the PNC product environment space, the products are a little easier to understand, and so you can self-buy. Uh, but we still feel there's a very, um, very key role for an agent in the buying journey in some of the more complicated products, be they, be they health or be they life products. Um, obviously, we will equip, equip the agents with specific digital tools. Like what? Uh, like just specific, like best practices? Uh, just in terms of financial needs analysis, in terms of um, um, tools to help them realize what they're maybe saving up for, their, you know, how, they need, they, how they should budget. 
Um, but ultimately, it's still a um, human interaction using a digital tool as opposed to necessarily trying to push the consumer into a digital channel and giving them only a digital choice. That's not necessarily the way that we see that relationship with the consumer. We think about being a partner, which is sat side by side, looking at the screen together. Um, and so we really do believe that, that the agent has a very important role in the future. Neil, what do you say in the fast-pacing city of Hong Kong? Um, yeah, I, th I think the agent and broker will continue to exist, um, parallel with all the different channels. Um, I think over the past uh, history, um, the, um, the customer expectation changed, and then the agents and broker role also changed. And how and what should they do? Same example uh, I just mentioned, and in the uh, very, very early stage, the uh, whole life endowment, high interest rate, proper season, agent and broker, very simple, they, they just present the product, sell the product. When investment making product comes up, yeah. agents and broker become advice and financial advisors, they have to equip themselves with the investment knowledge. Now, um, I have seen um, broker and agents um, using media, not only for, for, for selling, but also customer engagement and also How? Between. How do they do that? And name a concrete example of the press here. Okay, like uh, WeChat, WeChat is the most popular um, social, so, uh, uh, social channel, um, like, uh, just like WhatsApp in, in Hong Kong and Europe. Uh, WeChat has a very powerful uh, tool that allows you to broadcast uh, marketing message and news to a group of people, like subscribers. And in China, in Hong Kong, many agents and brokers are using WeChat to broadcast, to share information, to update news, to in fact to service. Do they see an uplift in sales when they do that? Yes, I definitely see. Otherwise, they will not be. But to, to be fair, I think the agents and broker become more segmented. So now they, they serve certain segments. Yeah, so, so what we, we see the segmentation too uh, in the West, and what we also see, and uh, what I see um, when we talk to agents and programs there, is they're not super successful ones, they're doing an old school with paper and Excel and all of that. And they say, you know, all this new media stuff, this is just not for me. What would you answer them doing the exams from around here? I, I would say they are, they are all right, but they are focusing on different segments. Different segments have different expectations, and then different segments has a certain intermediate to serve. In fact, we, we, we've done the research, and obviously, you know, in many markets in Asia, there, there's a constant battle for the talent of agents to, to be attracted to certain insurance companies. So we've done a lot of work to try and understand what agents are looking for, and, and, and we boil it down to what we call hallmarks, which is definitions of quality. Uh, you know, and the four hallmarks that we think agents are looking for, number one is social visibility. So how, how are we enabling agents to be more social, uh, more visible on social media, so that when a consumer at Friday at 9 o'clock at night types in on Google, well, I want to buy a life insurance product, do our agents appear in Google Maps of where they are and how they can access, that's number one. Paperless is another. <clears throat> how good are we at supporting them with needs-based advisory? And are we good at giving the agents leads you know, that come to our website? How do we enable that digital funnel that when someone says, I'd like to contact an agent, can we get them leads to support their business? Because that's, that, that's, you know, it is their business, that's, that's they are SMEs and that's And that. how do you do it? How do you help the agent? Maybe somebody who's in the mid 50s, super successful, that sees some problems in his customer before you help, how do you help them? I think, as, as Arthur said, I think you have to align um, the segment that you're targeting, the product that you have, and, and the customer experience that you want to build. And yes, you are right, there'll be some, some, some segments of maturity where you know you can still meet them in Starbucks and fill out a form, um, which is very you see it very common in Hong Kong. Um, there's still a lot of paper, but I think you know when you look at consumer behaviour and experience in non-insurance products, the expectation is growing that that's not what they want. They don't expect to be filling in paper. That they expect to have a digital relationship and they expect to be able to have somewhat 24-7 accessibility to be able to find an agent. You know, one, one of the, the uh, you know, I, I run a portfolio of markets and I still have one market that says, you know, you go online and to the contact us page and it says, please call us Monday to Friday, nine to six. And I'm like, well, 
Friday night. What's in the page from Europe? Just kidding. <laughs> no, it's, 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 one of our, it's one of our countries. And you, have okay. to, and, and you have to say to them, look, you know, if you're a consumer of Friday night at 11 o'clock at night, what's their next action? It's not to wait, it's to go to your competitor and try and see whether they can reach you as well. So, you know, I think it's really important that you, you have a really good understanding of the consumer you're trying to target and you build that experience that they're looking for. Okay, now we're going to do some a really, really dangerous thing. We're going to um, ask the questions the audience just wrote. Um, I would go uh, actually um, with uh, the first one. Neil, uh, is there any major difference you've seen in customer behavior in Europe and Asia? Um, yeah, I mean, it, well, part of the, the pain of my life and my role is that I have uh, my overlords are based in Italy, and so they, they don't really understand Asia very well. They think Asia is a big lump of landmass, um, and so I, you know, I spend a lot of time trying to explain to them the social differences. You know, and I think I, I look at the, the Asian consumer as highly mobile and highly digital, and then um, you know, we are we have uh, launched. Uh, in market in Asia, um, using WhatsApp as a communication device. You know, the, the Italians thought that was great, and then I said, I'm also doing it on WeChat, I'm doing it on Kakao, I'm doing it online, I'm doing it on Zalo, and their eyes just kind of glazed over because they didn't understand that in different markets, the primary communication platform is very, very different. And I think, you know, for, when I look at our businesses in Europe, there is very much a homogeneity between kind of Central Europe, the, the regulations are the same, the currency is the same, um, a lot of the consumer demographics are very similar. Here it's a very, very different story. And what are the biggest differences inside the ecosystem around here? Um, I think in, in Asia, um, we have many different countries and in fact the regulatory regime in every country is different, very different. Some countries require product approval, some countries does not. Some countries issue license quickly, some countries are very restrictive on licenses. Some countries do uh, uh, monitoring very stringently, some countries just very relaxed. So I think each country in Asia is very different, just, yeah. just to echo on a new and you have to look at it very differently and different market, different customer, totally. And, and then you explain to them that China is effectively, you know, a, a, a collection of 32 different markets. <laughs> that, that, you know, just because you have an entity in Shanghai doesn't mean you can go and open an office in Wuhan tomorrow. And again, you know, it's, it's part of the education that Asia is a very, very fragmented marketplace. The next question is, um, what is the number one tech innovation for improving customer interaction? And I would uh, add my personal note, um, is insurance actually a product that should be, the customer should interact with, or is it actually a low engagement product by itself? So what, what is the tech behind it, what, how you do it, and who should we actually do it? I, I think if, if, if you follow that logic through, I think if, if it's true that for the most part, if you look at um, customer interactions with insurance companies, it's very low. You know, the number of contacts you would require to have with an insurance company. In an ideal world, depending on the type of product, if it's a PNC product or a life product, the, the idea number of interactions is zero because you don't want to be in an accident, you don't want to die, so and ultimately you don't really want to have to contact the insurance company. If I think about a, a, an, an innovation that has helped address that, I think if you look at wellness solutions and, 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 and specifically in, with health insurance, I think the ability for insurance companies to create a conversation with their clients so that there is um, a, a way to, to deliver that bond, I think is one of the things I think has changed the dynamics of the insurance relationship. So should we bond with the customer and how we should we do it? I, I think it's up to the customer. I mean, you can, you can put it out there. You can try. Yeah, yeah, you can try, right? I mean, if, if, if it's relevant, uh, and then, then you'll help form a relationship. You can't force these things like, you know, like any other type of relationship. You, you can't force it. It has to be both, it has to be, you know, both parties have to want to be there. So um, for us, it's about creating relevant content, understanding what customers and consumers are interested in. And hopefully that, that helps drive um, a bond. And, and you can see, you can see that the difference in, um, in longevity, you can see the difference in profitability between those that do have a strong bond, those who are heavily promoters of the brand, from those that aren't. There are marked differences in, in, in those behaviors and the profitability of those customers. 
There's one question for Arthur um, from the audience, and that says, um, does the did the one degree research also similar products uh, in the petrol space in Europe? And um, well. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah, and and in fact, UK is the, um, the I, I believe is the biggest pet insurance market in the world. Yeah, we when we develop develop our pet insurance product, we do um, make reference to UK product and other other countries as well. But we try to um, also localize. Um, I believe insurance product needs to be localized um, because every just as I mentioned, every market is different, customer expectation is different, and for pet insurance particular, um, we cover the medical expenses and that relate to how the medical service for pets are delivered. So, so we, we work on the, the Hong Kong uh, web clinics and, and set partnership and develop products, but we do make reference to, to insurance products in other markets. Yeah, on a, on a personal note, what I think is really exciting about pet insurance um, is that it's a super emotional product and you know, the connection to the next, uh, to the topic before. Um, um, if you have to talk to pet owners who has a dog, I mean, maybe can I can ask you guys, who has pets at home here? Hands up. Hands up. 20% I would say, see, and I would say, you know, they you know, love the, 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 their pets. And um, I know actually insurers who have the pet insurance not as a profitability driver, but actually as an engagement vehicle. Uh, and you know, so that's super exciting. And um, another question we talked about about social, about different social channels. Videos exploding currently. 50% of worldwide internet traffic is um, video. Um, but the insurance industry um, is really underrepresented uh, in the West at least. How um, is the role of video and insurance and agent and brokers here? Um, for, for us, we look at, um, we're investigating video as a way to help with explaining um, products. I think uh, consumers these days, as you say, you look at the, 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 the traffic and the and internet usage, um, people are getting tired of reading and, and they're, they're much, it's easier to consume video. So we're doing work to standardize a lot of our onboarding processes to use videos to explain language. Um, we mentioned earlier the hallmarks on the distributor side, on the customer side, Language simplicity is a very key uh, key thing that we measure. What we did in Europe, when we looked at the sophistication of our language, it, it was at a level that only about 30 to 40 percent of the consumers could understand. It, it, was, it was very complicated. It wasn't particularly engaging. So video I think, gives us a really easy way. Uh, and of course, you know, in, in certain markets like India, where you have to have a welcome pack sent in the post, um, which you ever know what India Post is like, it's, it's not the most reliable. Um, and, and so video, again, helps bridge that gap between, you know, you just bought a product, you want to understand the product, and you don't have to wait three or four weeks for something to come through the post, which which be written, you may not understand very well. So video is crucial for us in that, and again, it's one of those things of a, of a consumer behavior, which is, which is changing, and we're, as insurance companies, kind of catching up with how consumer behavior is changing and leveraging it. Um, yes, I, I think video is becoming very, a very important part of the insurance as well because um, people are not reading it anymore. People expect to see uh, new concepts through video. And, and for insurance, it's the same. Insurance product is not an easy product to understand. Uh, now, nowadays, we can present a product idea through a three minutes video much better than a deck of I, I totally agree, and you know, um, we are also known for videos, but what I find quite striking is that um, we still produce the as an industry advertisement for the evening TV, for the analog TV. Nobody's watching that anymore, that statistic that show, for example, in Germany, the government TV is uh, ever, average age is over 60. Um, so nobody watches it anymore, but uh, there's still the commercial of the insurance agent um, being promoted by, uh, by a brand. So we're pouring millions and millions and millions still in marketing channels that don't work anymore. Um, uh, what, what do you say to that? I have not seen a single insurer going all in on you know, a social video. Um, look, we've just been through a, a global process around uh, identifying a new media agency, and, uh, and so part of that process was actually... I, I would know what I'd be thinking all of their... I'll tell you who it is offline. Uh, okay. uh, but but uh, one thing they did do is they looked at media channels and their influence, and, and so they've really come back to us 
um, with a refreshing look on all of our advertising spend in all of the markets, and, and that's from, from the large markets in Europe down to some of the Asian markets. And I think it, it, it's a fair point. I think the, the, the marketer themselves has a certain kudos about wanting to be on TV because it kind of supports their own that their own career project uh, uh, totally reasons. Yeah, yeah but I've got a TV ad, and I think you know, um, look at production costs of TV ads are horrendous. You can make things with digital much quicker, much easier, much simpler, and much faster. And I think you know, you, you have to really have a good understanding of your customers. If you don't, then you will just default to TV advertising, and I think that's that's a waste. Of, it's not a good use of money. Okay, yeah, I'm, 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 it's, um, I totally agree, and I think it's um, to do the safest thing that looks safe now is not always the same thing. And mm -hmm. um, now that we talk about agent and broker, I think another interesting topic is, at least in the West, is how the insurers manage and help their insurers, uh, their, their brokers and agents. How is it done right now? And it's a question, it's a long one. Uh, how is it uh, done right now? You have people going into their cars, driving to agents and brokers, drinking coffee, having talks about newest products. Um, but that's not scalable. So what we see at insurance down there is um, that they try to install their agent uh, and broker managers as micro-influencers and they produce small content via that uh, podcast and whatever for their 100, 150 agents and brokers. Is it something uh, you see here too or are agents and brokers managed differently by the large carriers? I, I think that's what we would let me call that the agent of the future, which for some demographics might be here today. It's not there for debate. I mean, you know, we're looking at platforms um, such as Hearsay and Sociable, which allows our agents to be more broadcasters, um, which I think is really useful. Um, the challenge from the head office point of view is, is restricting the content and controlling the content that agents can broadcast. That is a risk, certainly when you get into some of the, you know, I have, to have a, a story where we had an agent who had their, uh, they had my logo on their Instagram account and they were also selling ladies underwear off their own Instagram account. Um, and so you get into these brand issues on control and so you, you have to balance it because you don't want to necessarily dampen the enthusiasm of the agent who wants to broadcast, but you do have to remind them that, that they are a brand representative and there are certain things they should and shouldn't do. So there's a lot of training that has to go in for agents around the how to use social media properly. But isn't control actually dead in the times of where everybody can push a button and reach the world? Control is possible, it's not dead. Okay. <laughs> okay. And what are your experiences considering uh, the safest channel there? Um, um, we, 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 we don't have much to say on, on this topic from one degree perspective um, because, because we don't work with uh, traditional channels. Um, but based on my, my past experience in, in, in other companies, I, I have seen the very interesting um, a phenomenon. Um, in terms of the marketing material, uh, every country, the regulator has certain requirements. So, so in certain company, the company level, they have to produce material which is regulatory compliant. But then, that is, that is not the thing that agents want. So then agents sometimes they develop their own version. But then, then, then the company has to try to manage the, and, and balance uh, the regulatory compliance and the marketing impacts. I, I think that's a very interesting. We had an interesting question uh, coming from the audience. Thank you very much for all of that. Um, between AI and customer interaction. And I would like to rephrase a little bit. Uh, it, it, are AI solutions, chatbots, and things like that, um, are they customer interaction or are they actually the, uh, the opposite of it? Um, it, it? It's a great question. I have a, I have a very, very personal view on this, which is technology.